God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging seas. My God, he holds the victory.
Amen. Come on, let's lift up a shout of praise for Jesus this morning. It's so good to be able to worship together, amen. So good to be with family. For those I don't know, my name's Nick. I'm a student pastor here, and I hope you're doing well today. Is anybody doing well this morning? Come on. It's great to gather. Uh, I want to invite you to feel free to take a seat. Uh, it's so good to be with family, not just on a Sunday morning, but throughout the week, God's doing incredible things in our community. And Sunday morning is simply a celebration of that. So it's so good to be together today. I uh, wanted to take a moment this morning uh, as we spend time to worship to spend a moment in prayer and to take communion together as a family. Uh, as you came through either of the entrances, you probably had seen the elements in front of you. Hopefully you got a chance to grab the elements as you came in here to the sanctuary. We're going to take those out real quick. We're going to spend a moment uh, in communion and prayer together. This is one of the historic practices of the church that not just unites us to each other, but it unites us to Jesus. It's in moments of communion where Jesus himself draws close to us through the bread and the cup. This is a beautiful symbol of the unity we can have with Jesus. And because we have unity with Jesus, we have unity with one another. And there's no better place than before communion to lift up our needs to Jesus then. There are many of us who have needs out there. There are many of us who may be sick. There are many of us who may be, we might say, downtrodden. And this is a moment to lift up our prayer request to Jesus. Uh, if you have a prayer request, we can put some information on the screen for you. If you're looking to submit a prayer request, have someone pray for you. Whether you're joining us in person or online, there are people who are there to support and to pray for you. So submit your requests, join in prayer with us. And as we pray, I wanna share an update on Pastor Shane. He wanted us to share an update on how he's doing this morning. Many of you know that over the past week or so, he's had some Maybe a little bit concerning, a little, a little intense, he's been feeling it from his uh, positive COVID results. And so he's had some symptoms, but we need to know that he's doing well. His update for us today, he wanted me to thank each one of you first for praying for him as he's been experiencing symptoms. He's been in high spirits throughout, and uh, he just wants to say thank you for praying so much for him. Uh, Pastor and Heidi want you all to know how much they love and miss you. He turned a corner this past week and is doing so much better, praise God. Uh, but he's just feeling still too weak to join us today. Uh, he just needs a few more days to rest. And uh, Pastor Shane is looking forward to being back in the pulpit next week and preaching for Mother's Day. So please keep him in your prayers for total and complete healing. Uh, it's praise God for an incredible update. We're looking forward to having him back. He's been in high spirits throughout. And we wanna continue to pray. And not just for Pastor Shane, but for all the needs that are in the place. We want to spend a moment in prayer as we come to the table for communion together to lift up our prayer requests. So whatever that is for you, maybe you even physically lift it up to heaven in this moment, but let's lift up our prayer requests to Jesus as we enter the table of communion. Holy Spirit, we just say thank you for your constant presence with us. Jesus, we thank you for not just your sacrifice, but your continuing work that brings healing to us. So, Lord, as we bring our requests to you, we, we pray for our pastor, for Pastor Shane. Lord, would you raise us up, bring healing to Pastor Shane, bring healing to those who need healing today. God, as you draw close to us at the communion table, we draw close to you. We lift up our needs to you. We release it into your hands. And in response, Lord, we walk out anticipating a miracle, anticipating the healing. And no matter what happens, we'll give you praise in the meantime. We love you, we praise you, we thank you, and we pray it in your name. Somebody out there, lift an amen up. Amen. amen, amen. If you have the communion elements with you, we wanna spend a moment taking the bread and the cup together, remembering the presence of Jesus and all he's given for us. If you take the bread in your hand, I'm gonna lead, read from uh, Luke chapter 22 as Jesus sat around the table with his disciples, his followers. He took some bread in his hands and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we remember the gift that Jesus gave, his body for us, broken for us, with that in our hearts and our minds, let's take the bread together.
after supper, Jesus took a cup of wine and he said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people in agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Because Jesus gave everything for us, we have reason to celebrate and that's why we drink together. With that in our hearts and minds, let's drink the cup together. Jesus, we say thank you this morning, not just for your sacrifice, as you poured out everything for us, your body broken on our behalf. We say thank you, Lord, because it paved a new way of life for every single one of us. You've opened up a gateway to everlasting life and it's only through you. And for that, Lord, we say thank you. And we don't just say thank you, but we lift up our praise, we lift up our voices, we lay our lives down before you in pursuit of your way because it's the only way. So Jesus, this morning we cry out and we say thank you, Lord, that you're not just a healer, but you've made a way for eternal healing. And Jesus, because of that, we say thank you. And we pray all this in your name. Somebody again, lay out an amen. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, we have reason to worship this morning. I want to invite you to stand to your feet. Let's continue in that spirit of worship. Be thankful for the mercy and grace, unending, infinite, unconditional love of our Lord. We're going to sing about his faithfulness this morning. Thank you. 
Has he been faithful to you today? Can you close your eyes for a moment and just in your simple, quiet way, say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that your mercies are new every morning. Thank you for your faithfulness. in my life, the Lord has been reminding me that it's okay that the life we lead can bring trial. It's okay that the life we lead can bring discomfort. We're not immune to it. But he directed me here to Lamentations 3, 22, that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. His faithfulness is great. A life lived with God is not a life immune to stress, a life immune to discomfort, a life immune to not being happy, but it is a life guaranteed with pure joy, pure hope, and pure peace that passes over anything that your life can bring you in trial. As we sing this next verse, remember your God. Remember the one who brings that peace. i 
time has come Still my soul will sing your praise on him Praise Him once again for His faithfulness this morning. We thank You, Lord Jesus. We thank You that Your mercies are new every morning. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Thank You, Jesus. Come on, how many people are thankful for the faithfulness of God in your life? His faithfulness is so great. It's forever there. He's always faithful. So Jesus, we thank you for your faithfulness. You're faithful even when we're not. You're faithful even when our circumstances don't line up to what we want. You're faithful. we love you and we're just so ready to continue to experience life change today would you go before us set the stage for what you want to do
we're ready to receive from you this morning. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Come on, can we give it up for the Lord one more time? Thank you, Jesus. It's so good. Well, you guys can grab a seat this morning. Um, I hope that you have had a good day so far. I'm not sure what life has brought you this morning. Sometimes life brings you good things on a Sunday. And sometimes early in the morning as you come to church, uh, life can bring you some not so good things. But uh, this morning, I hope that you're prepared and your heart is set on experiencing what the Lord has for you today. And so I want to let you know of a few things. The first thing is this, that this Wednesday is our ordination service, and that's happening right here. And so we won't have the prayer service, but everybody is welcome to come to the ordination service. It's actually going to be a really cool um, moment, and so we want to encourage you to make it out to this. Um, if you're able to, and so wanted to let you know of that, though it won't be our typical prayer service, but it'll be an ordination service. So it's open to everyone, and then uh, last but not least, we just want to thank you so much for your continual giving. Um, as you honor the Lord through your generosity, I believe that God continues to bless and honor you in your life, and um, I know that Katie and I, we have set up reoccurring giving, and this is just something that we're able to continue to give to the Lord our first fruits. The things that we earn, we're able to give right back to the Lord right away. And so uh, I want to just encourage you even around that if, if maybe you're someone who says, you know what, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what that looks like. Really, it's just giving back to the Lord what he's already given to you. Because everything is the Lord's, Right? Everything that we have is already the Lord's. Everything that I own is the Lord's. So we're just giving back to, back to the Lord, saying, you know what, Lord? I trust you with my finances, and this is one of them. So thank you so much for your generosity and the ways to give are behind me as well. But I'm just so excited to be here this morning. I know that Pastor Shane is itching to come back. He misses you guys so much. Uh, he texted me earlier this week and let me know that I would be speaking again. My name's Adam, by the way. I'm one of the student pastors, but he is just looking forward to being back. So what we can do is we can really get behind him. We can get behind his family and just start praying and continuing to lift him up uh, to the Lord in, in prayer. And so I want to just ask you to do that um, all together, just as we did this morning, but throughout the week as well. It was such an honor to be here this morning, and if you have your Bibles, you can open on up to 1 Peter chapter 5. We won't uh, go there quite yet, but you can open on up to 1 Peter chapter 5. And the title of this message, if you're taking notes this morning, which I hope that you are, is uh, the title, if you're writing it down, you can write this down. Believe it or not, it's not about you. Believe it or not, it's not about you. You know, it's funny because as I write this message, I had a special heart check in my life, as do probably many people as they research and as they look at the Bible on the topic of humility. Now, this isn't like the best, like, we're going to talk about humility today, but I believe firmly that as we talk about humility, uh, we're going to go through different passages of Scripture, but humility is essential in the life of someone who calls themselves a Christian or is essential in the life of someone that follows Jesus. Humility is so important as we look throughout Scripture. And to be honest, I think many of us would probably say if we look at our lives that maybe we're humble. But if we were to look a little deeper and dig a little deeper into who we are, maybe we would see that it's not so accurate. Pride is... Uh, something that is in opposition to humility. And I, I think I speak for most people that oftentimes pride is easy to creep in. Now, I can't speak for everyone this morning, and I know some people personally in my life that live and resemble a life of humility, but I believe that it's one of the greater topics in Scripture because Scripture clearly tells us that God opposes the proud, and he blesses the humble. There's a stark contrast to the proud and to the humble, and I want to read a couple definitions for you this morning. The first one is simply pride. The definition is this, having or showing a high or excessively high opinion of oneself or one's importance. Humble, the definition of the word humble is a modest or low view 
of one's own importance or humbleness. We can see that these are in direct opposition to one another. And I would even say this as we dive into scripture this morning, that a humble person has a stronger voice of influence rather than a proud person that just has a loud voice. And today we're gonna be in 1 Peter here in just a moment, but C.S. Lewis quotes it this way, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. In other words, thinking about other people more. How can I think, how can I put others before myself? How can I put others first? And Thomas Merton says it this way, pride makes us artificial, humility makes us real. I wonder if we've ever had a situation in our life before where we've been truly humbled. I don't know if you've ever had something in your life or a situation before where you felt truly humbled. I can remember a time when I was in college and I met Katie for the first time and I thought she is the one. I don't know if you've ever experienced that before, but I knew that when I met Katie, she was the one. Now, Katie is my wife. Um, and and I, was, I knew that I just, the Lord dropped her in my life, and it wasn't on mistake, but it was for a reason. And so uh, we went on a missions trip and basically got to know each other a little bit, and after we got to know each other, uh, we went off to the summer. The summer rolled around, and Katie stayed in Missouri where we were in college, and I came home to Pennsylvania, and this one day in particular, I just thought, I'm going to call her up. I'm calling her up. So I give her a ring on the telephone, and she answers the phone, and I'm like, hey, what's going on? How are you? And she's like, I'm, I'm good. Like, is everything okay? And I'm like, oh, yeah, things are really good now. Like, is everything good with you? She's like, this is, uh, yeah, like, things are good. Like, why are you calling me? And I was like, all right, well, here's really the reason why I'm calling you is because there is a baseball game, a Major League Baseball game that's happening right before we, we start uh, college, like three days before. Like, we'll be in Missouri together, um, and there's a baseball game happening. Your favorite team is the St. Louis Cardinals. My favorite team is the Pittsburgh Pirates, and they're playing in St. Louis. Now, something you need to know about me is my favorite team is not the Pittsburgh Pirates, All right, but I'm from Pennsylvania, and so I use this to my advantage, if you know what I mean. So I'm like, listen, my favorite team is the Pittsburgh Pirates. Yours is the St. Louis Cardinals. We got to go. But not, you know what? But I just want to let you know, Katie, if you don't want to go, that's fine. I'm going to go by myself. This is like, right? This is not the truth. Like, I'm not going to go by myself. But I was like, Katie, if if you want to go, though, like, I'll buy your ticket. Like, no problem, I'll buy your ticket. So Katie's like, you know what, yeah, that sounds kind of fun. Like, let's go ahead and do that. So we both get to Missouri. We get to uh, where where we're at in college, Evangel, and uh, we start traveling three hours to St. Louis. Uh, We spend three hours at the baseball game, and then we travel three hours back to Springfield. Now, I don't know about you, but in the midst of nine hours, you either realize you really like the person or you don't at all. And I'm happy to say today that we hit it off. It was really good. We got back to college and we went on these things that weren't called dates because we weren't dating at the time, but we were definitely going just the two of us. And I may or may not have paid a couple times, but we just, you know, we we definitely weren't, it wasn't a date. And uh, so, so, you know, we would go to coffee shops and various places. And then I thought to myself, this is the day. This is the moment. She's the one. I'm going to tell her how I feel. We're going to go to, Katie, would you like to go to dinner? Yes. We go to dinner. And I'm strategic in my planning. And so I do what what I do best. I think to myself, I'm going to tell her on the way back to college from dinner. Because if she turns me down, we'll open up the door. She goes right out. I never see her again. It's a great thing right there. So we're on the way back. We're in the car traveling, and and I start to tell Katie, listen, Katie, I think we need to take our relationship to the next level. We need to make this official. We need to be official so people know, you know, we need to... We need to do things like we, we, need, to, we need to post it on Facebook because everybody knows that's what makes it official. 
We need to do, we need to make this official. And what do you, I'm spilling my feelings to Katie and uh, telling her how I feel about her. And as we're parked on campus, ready for the door to fling open and her to leave, because I have no idea. And she says to me, Adam, I, I feel the same way. You know, I, I've been thinking the same thing and, and uh, like everything that you're saying, like these are things that are processed. I think the same thing, but I think it's a good idea. Yeah, like I like that. And I told Katie from this moment, never use the conjunction but unless there's something negative afterwards. In this moment, and I wanna share this with you today, listen, if you're talking about something positive, if you're going to be sharing something good, don't use that word beforehand because usually it signifies that there's something bad coming afterwards. In that moment of my life, I felt like the lowest, the most humble because I was vulnerable, yet Katie said, but... I'm like, why are you using that word? Even to this day, we, I use this story many times, and my roommates at the time were like, Katie, but what? You know, and it's this whole ordeal. But in that moment, I felt really humbled because truly I thought, this is it. I just laid everything on the table. There she goes. But I knew that afterwards, after I was humbled, that this was something that was going to last. And we're gonna talk about humility today. Humility is not necessarily an easy topic to talk about, but I do believe that as we act in humility, as we do what Jesus is calling us to do, we are going to live a life of difference. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse five through six, it says this. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. This morning, I just want to pray for us as we dive in to 1 Peter and what God is speaking to us this morning. Jesus, we love you. We thank you so much for your word. Guide us and direct us today and to call us to become more like you. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen, amen, amen. At the beginning of 1 Peter chapter five in verses we didn't read, Paul is describing what it's like for someone to be in spiritual oversight called an elder. Now an elder is simply referring to the maturity in the wisdom of a person uh, that typically in this time frame was an older person making them qualified for leadership, the, the wisdom and the maturity. Now in application and practicality, it was less about the specific age and more about the wisdom and more about the maturity. So Peter goes on to give leadership directions uh, to, to give those uh, that are leading some direction and then he redirects his attention to the younger people for a moment and says to honor those that are above them. Honor those that we're just talking about right here beforehand. And directly after this, and this is where I wanna spend most of our time this morning, Peter, he brings this application of humility to everybody. He says, all people. Peter is bringing this application, and this is where I'm gonna sit this morning for the most part. Peter brings this application of humility not to just old people, not to just young people, not to just males, not to just females, but to everybody. Peter is bringing this application and he's telling older people to be humble when approaching younger people and younger people to be a, a humble when approaching older people and males to be humble when approaching females and females to be humble when approaching males. He's saying this to all people. Can everybody say all people? That was weak. Everybody say all people. There we go. Come on, this isn't youth group. You guys, come on, you got this. The first thing I wanna talk about this morning is this. The first thing is humility is a prerequisite for unity. Humility is a prerequisite for unity. 
says this in verse 5, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. And there's an understanding that we, when we act in humility towards one another, it fosters unity among the body of Christ. In fact, the absence of humility breeds disunity. Have you ever wondered why the world that we live in is so disunified? Have you ever wondered to yourself or maybe to other people why churches across the nation are so disunified? Have you ever wondered why people call themselves Christians, but yet we're not linking arms and fighting the good fight together like we should be? Have you ever wondered why there's such disunity within the body of Christ sometimes? And I think one of the main reasons is because we have fallen subject to the self-centeredness of our culture and forgot the mandate of humility as a Christ follower. If the church can't act in humility, and if the church isn't going to be an example of unity, why would we expect the world to operate like that too? Philippians chapter two, verse three, it says this, be free from pride-filled opinions, for they will only harm your cherished unity. Don't allow self-promotion to hide in your hearts, but in authentic humility, put others first and view others as more important than yourselves. Can I talk to you this morning? Humility is something hard to live by, but oh, it can change the world around you because it's not about you, but it's putting the focus on other people. In fact, it's taking the focus off yourself and it's putting it on the people around you. See, this connection of humility and unity is very important when talking about Christians that want to see the world around us know the Jesus within us. Because here's the deal. Who in their right minds would want a relationship with Jesus if the people that are following Jesus aren't even willing to humble themselves? Hey, if the people in the church aren't willing to humble themselves and to unify, why would anybody else want to follow Christianity? The reality, however, is that we can see biblically that when you are humble, it is insurmountably more effective than giving my prideful opinions because humility, it tills the ground for heart change in the lives of people because humility takes the focus off of you and it puts it onto other people. I can't tell you how many people in my life I've heard the phrase this. I just, I'm looking for what I can get. What do I get out of this? What do I earn out of this? Rather than saying, what can I give? I've heard this many times in, in various churches. I'm going to church to see what I can receive versus saying, how can I build the church? And if you're a Christian today, I wanna share something with you. You're called to build the local church. This isn't just like something that's like in the air and ran, like, like we, we can't come to church and say, what am I going to receive? What am I going to get out of it? We have to come and say, what can I do to put into it? How can I help to build the church? How can I help to change the church? Because when I do that, then the world around me changes. You're called to build the church. The church is the bride of Christ. I'm not just saying CLA, but when you help to build CLA, when you serve, you are serving the kingdom of God and you're really helping to build the kingdom of God. The church is the vehicle to carry the love of Jesus to other people. The church is the vehicle to carry the hope, the forgiveness, the healing to other people. And if the church isn't going to do it, no other place is going to do it. So rather than saying, what am I going to get today? What if we said, what can I give today? How can I build the church today? I can remember some of the best teams that I've ever been on are the teams that people get out of their own way and they're willing to put their personal preferences aside for the greater good of the team. I can remember some of the best teams that I've ever been on are people where they knew they were right, but they were willing to put that aside so that someone else's idea to go with that so that way it could generate momentum with unity. 
those were the teams that accomplished a lot and that could work through anything together. And I can remember some of the worst teams that I've ever been on, some of the worst teams that I've ever coached, where people would feel the need to share their side of things and the need to be right, and their opinion mattered more than the unity of the team. And these teams, they never amounted to much. They never accomplished much. They never, they never did really anything significant. Now, the power of humility and the willingness to demonstrate submission and put away our own agendas is the day we will see God do great things through our obedience. But in opposition is pride, and when pride steps in the way, it, it, it stops God from being able to do incredible things through you. Scripture says God opposes the proud, and gives grace, or your version might say, or blesses the humble. But if we can't humble ourselves in the world, we'll never humble ourselves for the world. I want to add this today that it's a misconception in our world that humility isn't powerful. The society that we live in, it's the one who is who is more upfront, it's the one who is more aggressive, it's the one who is more ruthless, the one who has more power that has a greater voice and that has more power, but it's just not that way when talking about the kingdom of God. The truth is this, we don't get our power from self-attained uh, means, self-attained things, but we get our power, we get our strength by God who establishes the power within us. Humility is not passive, it's active. Don't mistake that. Humility is not weak. It's strength. Don't mistake that. Because our world will say that humility is weakness, but our God says humility is strength. Humility can take you places that you would have never gone by yourself. Humility will change the trajectory of other lives around you. But it's counterintuitive to the world that we live in because the world that we live in says that humility is weak. But biblically it says that it's not weak, but it's something that God is behind and he wants to encourage and strengthen. Pride will say, take out the person and reform, but, or, or, uh, rebuttal firmly. Don't care about the other person. Humility will say, let the person go before you and then serve them. Maybe it's time for you to lay down always needing to be aggressive with your opinions. Maybe it's time to start listening to those around you that don't know Jesus and considering them better than yourselves. Maybe it's time not to fight in anger or frustration, but rather let, a, let God open a door through humility before you. Because the truth is this, there is a blessing that comes with humility. There is a blessing that comes with humility. And the blessing of humility is great. I don't know if you've ever uh, experienced a blessing that stemmed from humility before. Maybe there's a moment where you were humble and you found that there was a blessing that was attached with it. I can remember, and I wanna take you back again for a moment to when I was in college. I rolled up on the scene. I was a freshman, didn't know anyone, and I rolled up in Springfield, Missouri, and as I did, College for the first week, I realized that, you know, my clothes were piling up. I needed to do some laundry, so I gathered up my clothes, and I went into the, the laundry place where there's a washer and a dryer, and I opened the washer, and I thought to myself, oh, my gosh. I don't know one of the most fundamental things that a person needs to know how to do, the laundry. I actually don't know how to do the laundry. You might be like, wait a second, your mom never taught you? I just wanna say this, my mom always did my laundry and I'm thankful for that, all right? She was a servant and she did that for me, incredible. She's an incredible woman. So don't, don't think for a second, don't judge her, all right? So I was in college and, and so I went to my roommate and uh, I asked my roommate, man, can you teach me how to do laundry? I don't know how to do laundry. He's like, dude, I don't know how to do laundry. And so I look, I look at him and I'm like, this is college, we don't do laundry. Like, we're just gonna go the whole time and not do laundry. This is amazing, right? Like, this is great. 
And so, uh, but I went down the hall and I asked someone else, I'm like, hey, can you, do you know how to do laundry? Can you teach me how to, how to do laundry? I don't, I don't know, I don't know how to do this. And I remember he, you know, he was like, absolutely, let me, let me show you. But for me, not knowing anyone in the first week of school, it was a really humbling thing to ask someone else how to do laundry. Something that we often take for granted. I actually love doing laundry now at this point. And I do that in our house. I'm the laundry person in the house. But here's the, here's the thing is it took humility for me to do this. And through humility, praise God, I was blessed by clean clothes because I was willing to ask, all right? And let me tell you something. Katie was really appreciative that I learned how to do laundry and didn't smell. So that's a good thing. <laughs> Scripture says this, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. In other words, when you're prideful, you're living in another camp. You're living in, in a different spot in opposition to God. And th throughout scripture, it was many times where pride would tear down people. Pride would tear down families. Pride would tear down nations. It was the pride that did this, yet through humility, they received a blessing of God. It was by the humble that people would receive a blessing. In fact, oftentimes throughout scripture, it was the humble that were at a disadvantage physically, but gained the upper hand because they weren't focused on what they had. They weren't focused on who they were, but they were focused on God and being humble. Because focusing on who God is and being humble, it will bring you victory. Uh, focusing on being humble and focusing on God will bring victory that could never come through you being the best, but through a humble surrender. Listen, some of you today are looking for victory in your life, and it's gonna come through a humble surrender. Some of you today are trying to fight the fight and trying to do things on your own, but the truth in reality is this, it's going to come, the victory will come through a humble surrender. We see it all throughout scripture, actually, that those that are weak but yet are humble are those that become victorious. God blesses those that are humble. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse two, it says this, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse four, it says this, humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 23, it says this, pride brings a person low, but the lowly in spirit gain honor. Honor is a highly sought out element within the Bible. And it's incredible the blessing that God will give someone that has a life and lives a life with a heart of humility but humility is tough and in its purest form is unattainable without Jesus. What's interesting to me is the level of humility that you live in your life will reflect the level of commitment that you have to Jesus. And we can all call ourselves Christians, but if we don't act in humility, we're really not operating in how God has called us to be. If we're not acting in humility every single day, we're not operating the way God has intended us as Christians to operate. God wants to usher his grace. God wants to usher his blessing on your life, but you'll never experience his fullness if you don't understand the fullness of humility. As we close this morning, you can write this down. Demotion equals promotion. Demotion equals promotion. It says this in verse six, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you. God will take you places in your life that you can never get to on your own. And when you demote yourself by the world standards, God promotes you by the kingdom standards. It's really counter to what we would think in our culture today in a culture where we have to earn and where we have to gain everything, where we have to build our own lives, where we have to uh, trust in our own talents and gifts that really aren't man-made, but they're God-given. And the thing is this, that 
God, he wants to bless you and he wants to promote you and he wants to lift you, but we have to understand that we, we need to demote ourselves in a worldly standard before we ever let God elevate us in a kingdom standard. See, it's not how far you get in the world, but how much you give of yourself to God. Life is not about temporary success, but about eternal impact. And what you have to realize today, that the moment that we think that we've built our lives and the things around us is the moment we've lost sight of our creator. When you lower yourself and when you humble yourself, you're act, actually allowing God to go before you. And when God goes before you, that's when he exalts you. To lower yourself before God actually means letting him elevate you. It says this in James chapter 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Luke chapter 14, verse 11 says this, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Matthew chapter 18, verse four says this, so anyone who becomes as humble as this little child had to guess, I bet there would be some people in here today who would say, maybe you need to humble yourself because of all of the pride and the selfishness that's creeped in. Maybe your failure to look at other people as more important than yourself. And I bet there's some people in here today that are willing to quit something that you've started because it's not what you want or because you're not getting what you want. I bet there are some people in here today who have lost connection with loved, one, loved ones relationally because pride has gotten in the way and you couldn't see past yourself. I bet there's people in here today devoted to certain causes and organizations and political parties than being devoted to the unity of the church. All throughout the New Testament, the idea and concept in the call of unity among the church is very high. And what disunifies is a lack of say that, and I know people in my life that are more devoted to the things around them to, than, to, than being devoted to the unity of the church. And today I wonder what the world would look like if we would just stop only reading the Bible and hearing about it, but actually do what it's compelling us to do. How would the world around you change if you would act in humility? This is something as well that I often use the word you while I'm speaking. I'm speaking directly to myself, I promise you that. As I read and as I do research and as I preach these messages, I think to myself, man, I've got some stuff to work on in my life. As a pastor, I've got to live this life of humility better than I ever have before. I've got work to do. And I would guess that you probably do too. Humility is hard to live by. It's a high calling, but it's a calling that is asked of us. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace and he blesses the humble. Where do you camp today? Where is your life today in the grand scheme of it all? What does it look like when you go to work school, when you're next to someone that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, because I want to tell you something, if, we call, if I call myself a Christian, yet don't act in humility, I'm really just discrediting what God is asking me to do. Thankfully, His grace is there because we're not perfect, and 
and I'm thankful for that because I will never be perfect. But as we strive to know our creator, the one who is perfect, he then helps us and instills humility, but we have to open our hearts up and be willing to be wrong sometimes. You've got to be willing to set aside your personal preferences to be able to, to unify, to be able to be humble, to be able to speak life into other people. I think so many times we're excited to share our opinions because we're prideful people. This morning, if you would stand as we close today, and the worship team comes up, I really just want to close and pray for a couple groups of people. This morning, if you're in here and if you're in here and maybe you don't know Jesus, I want to pray with you today. All across the room, if you would just uh, bow your head and close your eyes. And this isn't anything like super spiritual. This is really just so that way it's you and Jesus. No one around, just you and him, just focusing on you and Jesus. Today, if you would say, I don't know Jesus, but what you're talking about is really stirring my heart, and I want to know Jesus, and, and not just know him like, you know, one day, but I want to journey my life with Jesus. I want to understand what this life of being a Christian is all about, because you're speaking about humility, which is maybe you're in here today, and you've experienced Christians that are quite the opposite. Listen, today, if if a Christian is, is full of pride, that's not really a Christian at all, but we want to be people of humility, because that's what God has called us to be, and if you're in here today, and you would say, I want to know the Jesus that you're talking about. I want to know the Savior of the world. If that's you today, would you raise your hand right now? Yeah, I see that hand. Awesome. I see that hand, another hand. Awesome. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah, I see that hand. A couple hands right there. Yeah, awesome. Another hand up there. Very good. Anybody else today with nobody looking around that's willing to say, that's me. I want to I wanna know Jesus as my personal Savior. I want to ask another question this morning. Do you need Jesus to come on your behalf so that way you can live a life of humility. In other words, do you need some fulfillment from the Holy Spirit so that way you can live a life of humility? Maybe you're struggling with being prideful or always needing to be the center, but yet today you say, God, I want to be someone that lives a humble life. I want to be someone that that, 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 uh, that brings unity to places rather than disunity. If you're someone today that says, that's me, Pastor Adam, pray for me because I want to take unity into the world that I live in and I want to take humility into the world that I live in. If that's you today, would you just raise your hand all across this room? Come on, anybody else? Yes, so many hands today. Who else? Who else would lift a hand and say, that's me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, all across this room, if you feel comfortable, we're going to pray. And we're going to pray for those who want to receive Jesus. We're going to pray for those who want more humility and the, the capability, the, the space in their life for humility. If you would, all across this room, if you feel comfortable, would you just lift your hands to heaven? So Jesus, we come before you right now in this moment. And we ask you, God, to do what only you can do. Would you change our lives from the inside out? God, I pray that those who want to know you would journey with you and it would start today. Today would be the day that, they, that the old things have passed and the new things are before them. Jesus, I pray that this relationship would be something that isn't, isn't lukewarm, it's not cold, but it would be something that's on fire for you. God, I pray for those in this place this morning that would say, I want to live more of a life of humility. In the world that I live in, I want to be the difference, and that comes through humility. And God, I want to be the person that helps the church unify, because through the church, 
the world will come to know Jesus. And all of those people that have raised their hands, God, I pray that you would put a special anointing, a special presence on their life today. Lord, that they would feel you, they would know you, that they would experience your power. That every single day when they leave their home, every single day when they're at home, every single day when they wake up, every single day when they go to sleep, that they would be reminded of the humility that you took on the cross for us. Lord, so that way we can live a life of being humble. So today, Lord, I pray that you would fill your people in this place that you would encourage your people in this place, that you would challenge your people in this place to live a life of humility, which then breeds unity. God, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, come on, can we give God some praise in this place today? Listen, if you gave your heart to the Lord or you wanted to to know more about Jesus or you want someone to walk next to you, there's gonna be a slide on the screen and it's our, simply our next steps. Text this in here, and we want to journey with you on your relationship with Jesus. We love you so much. Come back next week. Pastor Shane is preaching a good word next week. It's Mother's Day. Don't forget your flowers and thanks for your mothers. We love you guys so much. We'll see you next week. Walk in the Lord today.